It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. Philip L. Barlow serves as guest host in this episode. He sits down with Dr. Ravi Gupta to talk about faith and scholarship. Dr. Gupta was a visiting scholar at the Maxwell Institute this semester and a previous guest here on the Maxwell Institute podcast. He's a practicing Hindu and also a scholar of Hinduism, and he's become a close friend of the Institute over the past few years. And he's known Dr. Barlow for even longer. So you're about to hear two old friends talking about the benefits and drawbacks of being a believer and a scholar of one's own religious tradition. Questions and comments about this and other episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast can be sent to me at mipodcast at byu.edu. It's our associate director, Philip L. Barlow, talking with Dr. Ravi Gupta of Utah State University in this episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast. Ravi, it's a pleasure to be with you. We're pals from way back up in our Logan days together at Utah State. So uh, this isn't a first meeting for us, and we're just delighted, as you already know, everybody around the Maxwell Institute is delighted at your uh, presence here this semester. And we wish you, we had you longer, but I've had many signals from my friends up at Utah State not to try to put clutches into <laughs> you, so we know that you're here just through December. Thank you so much, Phil. This morning, I'd like to talk to you about several things. I'd like to talk to you about your personal life a little bit, um, your personal life among the Latter-day Saints in particular. I'd like to talk about the nature of your work and approaches to work, and specifically what you're working on now uh, in the semester that you have with us. And um, the Maxwell Institute, as you know, is set up to be a research institute on the topic of religion. And our particular mode of operation is to gather and nurture, support, disciple scholars as these scholars engage the world of wider ideas, but also with the interest of nourishing, fortifying Latter-day Saints in their belief and in the exploration of really fostering good causes and allegiance to values and trying to make a better world. So that's not foreign to you, but you're operating here in a Latter-day Saint context while being a Hindu scholar, and I'd be interested in, in some of that conversation too. So I wish you would tell us just a little bit about your life. You've said in a previous interview with Blair Hodges that people can check out uh, the topic of that interview was exploring what disciple scholarship means in your understanding and your own practice. So we won't revisit that in any depth here, but um, my memory is that you were born in Chicago, but you were raised in Boise. Tell us a little bit about that. There is a considerable minority of Latter-day Saints in the Boise area. Of course, you would have encountered some of us exotic creatures. <laughs> It's uh, wonderful to be here, Phil, here at the Maxwell and here with you in particular. Um, I visited the Maxwell, as you mentioned, some time ago and secretly hoped that I would get a chance to spend more time here amongst the very wonderful community of disciple scholars that you all have nurtured here. So it's a privilege to be here and to be talking to you today. Um, you're, you're right in that my father and mother moved to Boise, Idaho when I was just four years old. And so my earliest memories are from Boise. Uh, my parents came to the United States to study, and as a child of immigrants, I grew up in the middle of two cultures, uh, the culture which my parents brought with them when they moved to the United States, and the culture I was steeped in around me uh, in Boise, Idaho. And I think a big part of my upbringing in Boise was shaped by being in a place where I was constantly representing who I was to a broader community. You see, we were one of uh, maybe a handful of Hindu families in Boise. And my parents ran the only Hindu temple in all of Idaho, uh, which served as the main gathering place during festivals and on regular weekends for much of the Indian community. And so we were regularly asked to come and speak about Hinduism and India and at all kinds of different events. And in that process, I got to know a variety of different religious communities, different groups in the valley, and of course, the LDS community as well. Uh, I remember as a child, uh, missionaries visiting um, the temple or prospective missionaries who were planning to go out into 
various parts of the world and they wanted to uh, encounter a little piece of culture and religion and tradition here in Boise before they went out and having conversations with them, giving them tours of the temple even as a child. And that left a, a, a marked impression on me, not to mention the institute that was flourishing and well built right across from Boise State University, where I did my undergraduate studies. The LDS Institute of yeah. Religion, that is. Yes. Were you well accepted as a Hindu family in Boise, Idaho, or were there dimensions of that that were edgy? I've got nothing but good memories of uh, life in Boise as uh, a Hindu. Um, we were very welcomed, and Boise at that time particularly uh, was a place that was eager to um, encounter new traditions and cultures just because there were so few people from different places. Now it's grown much more and become much more of a diverse place. But at the time, we were invited to more or less every interfaith event that took place from the Thanksgiving interfaith service at the Cathedral of the Rockies to interfaith panels to the opening of the Anne Frank Memorial in Boise. And in all of those events, uh, we were representing who we were. And I was often asked to speak. My parents were very wise in, in pushing me forward and saying, Ravi, you should speak here. And that gave me my first experience of speaking, but also of representing who I was and articulating my identity to others. Mm, well, that sounds like a nice opportunity. I should confide to our listeners that you are were, still are, and by the standards of the academy or the time frames of the academy, a child prodigy, kind of a child wonder. You were homeschooled and you were off to Boise State before your 13th birthday and you accomplished a doctorate in the study of religion at Oxford University by age 21, if memory serves. Uh, so tell us about that. Are we to think of you as a brainiac from outer space? Base uh, different than the rest of us normal <laughs> mortals, or just what was it like being a child wonder at a university at age 13? How were you accepted there? What was that like? Well, regardless of what I say, I uh, I think some people are going to always think of me as a brainiac from outer space, but <laughs> I, I hope um, this interview will serve at least a little bit to calm their fears of who I <laughs> might be. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I had an unusual upbringing. Uh, I was homeschooled, as you mentioned, and that meant my mother particularly educated me and my younger brother at home in a variety of different subjects, but primarily focusing on the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic or mathematics, uh, with the conviction that these are the foundation of all other forms of um, study and education that we might want to do later on in life. And uh, my early admission to Boise State University, uh, I was just about to turn 13 at the time. This was something that wasn't really planned. And I think this is something that differentiates our home education from how many people think of homeschooling, especially outside of Idaho and Utah, where it's less common. A lot of people think of homeschooling as a way for the parents to push the children to their limits, lock them in a room with a stack of books and, and make sure that they study everything as quickly as possible. For my parents, it was very much the opposite. Um, of course, we had books and of course we studied, but only a few hours a day. And most of our day was filled with engagement with the community. And I think that's what helped make my homeschooling a lot more quote unquote normal uh, in terms of its trajectory because so much of my life was engaged with human interaction. And that was what I remember most about my homeschooling. And that's what I enjoyed the most. Of course, I loved reading. Uh, I've always loved reading and studying and the bookish side of uh, homeschooling. Uh, but that engagement was really powerful uh, for me, both within the Hindu community, uh, which, um, you know, the temple was there and we were engaged with that, but also with the broader community in which we lived. And yeah, I, in hindsight, I think it was that which eventually led me to choose a life as a teacher because I was already so used to being present in a situation and expressing who I was and what I wanted to tell a group of people. Hmm. That may already have answered my next question, but the question was going to be, how did a brainiac from outer space <laughs> become so grounded and so sane and so gracious? I've known you for a number of years. I know your family. 
it is a family that any Latter-day Saint would be thrilled to be a part of and represents um, many things that Latter-day Saints strive for in terms of generosity and an informed, intelligent, thoughtful faith and an outreach to others. And being a child wondered or just very smart and able to navigate the challenges of a university at such a tender age. I wouldn't have been in high school was challenging enough socially for me in doing that. So I've wondered, uh, marveled not just at your intelligence and your scholarship, but your graciousness and how that all worked out. Maybe you've answered that question already, or is there anything else to say about that? I hope I'm not embarrassing you, but I actually think it's important for people to think about, for me to think about. Well, thank you, Phil. That's very kind of you. There are times, uh, actually quite often, when people come to my parents or they come to me and they say, I would like my children to accomplish academically what your child did or what you did. How do we do that? And the first thing that my mother will tell them, or I will tell them, is to say, don't try to. Because I think the biggest mistake that parents can make, particularly in this kind of homeschooled situation, but also if children are going to school, is to set their goals in front of the children and then push them hard to meet the goals that are really all about them, that is the parents, rather than about the children. And for us, I think the, the biggest blessing for me was that this was never planned by my mother or father. It just, it happened in a very organic sort of way. Um, my parents were running a, a Govinda's Indian vegetarian restaurant in Boise uh, for about six years when I was a child. And I would do my studies there while my parents were cooking or or running the place and and as I did my work customers would come in and and they would need to be introduced to what Indian food was and so I would get up or my brother would get up from our work and we'd introduce them to basmati rice and pakoras and what curry was and after they finished going through the buffet to do the cash register and take the money and and then once they left to clean up the tables and put everything in the dishwasher and again that was an element of we didn't realize at the time, as in my brother and I, we didn't realize that that was a part of our education. We thought we were getting a break from our studies. But in reality, again, like my engagement with the community, this was another way in which both of us learned what it meant to greet someone, to host someone, to welcome them in a way that they would want to enjoy that food, that they would want to come back. It was a family business. It was something we did completely uh, as a labor of love. It wasn't our primary income. It never was planned to be. My father worked for Hewlett Packard as an engineer, but we did it uh, because we wanted to engage with, the, with our community in that way. So I learned much from that experience. And from that uh, came my studies at BSU as well. So there was um, a professor who used to come and eat regularly, and he would talk to us, my brother and I, regularly, just as other customers would. He told my parents one day, he said, I don't know what you're doing with him in terms of homeschooling, but he might consider, if you've run out of things to do, he might consider taking just a course at Boise State University in English, because Ravi seems to be good with language. And my mother liked the idea, partly because she thought it would be a great way for me to progress and partly because we were all overwhelmed with the restaurant. And so um, that's how it started, just with a single course as a way to supplement what I was doing anyway. So back to my point that I think it's very important that it not be something that is forced or pushed, but something that emerges naturally, because I think every child has their own trajectory, their own path to follow, and it will emerge given enough care and some protection and some risk-taking and pushing. I think that emerges. 
Mm. I'm very provoked and interested by the natural integration of life and community involvement and the eventual trajectory of your education, something for all of us in education to think about. My name again is Philip Barlow here at the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship, continuing the conversation with Dr. Ravi Gupta, visiting scholar at the Institute this semester. Um, let's get into your work a little bit, if we may, Ravi. You are a Hindu studying Hinduism. Talk about that a little bit. Are there any dangers of being too inbred when you're a member of a religious tradition, specifically yours, studying your own tradition in the academy? There is, of course, and that danger. And I think history is replete with examples of religious communities becoming too insular and becoming concerned with matters that um, cut them off from the larger world in, that they inhabit. And I think that's particularly a risk for us today in the globalized world that we live in and where our neighbors might be from a variety of different religious traditions. It's so important that we engage. But I think when done well, when done correctly, religious persons studying their own tradition can be very powerful uh, supportive and even sometimes destabilizing in a good way, destabilizing force that can break us out of our insular communities and help us to relate to the other by, first of all, starting and reflecting critically about ourselves and who we are and how we relate to others in our community. And so that's why I particularly appreciate this opportunity at the Maxwell, because as a Hindu studying Hinduism, I am with LDS scholars studying the LDS tradition, and in this way, we both study ourselves, but we also do it in conversation with the other. And I think that's where that disciple scholarship becomes the healthiest. And again, you may already have preempted this question, but you're a Hindu studying Hinduism in America. There are rather more Muslims in America than Hindus and rather more Baptists in America than Hindus. Um, is there anything about the American setting that's distinctive? And now, after teaching in Kentucky and Florida, was it, and Virginia at William and Mary, now you're a Hindu studying Hinduism in the United States of America, in Utah, and now at BYU. So that's a bit of a layered context for being a cultural outsider, or maybe you're a cultural insider by now, but some of your tradition do or don't know that? Or is there anything else to say about those contexts? Yeah, I've come to the conclusion that everyone is an outsider and everyone is an insider, depending on how we look at the situation. And I've, I've kind of given up trying to figure out whether I'm an outsider or I'm an insider simply because, well, here I am with two mother tongues, Hindi and English, having spoken both fluently as a child, living in two cultures at the same time, in, in the United States, uh, where I was born and raised, but then also spending sometimes as a child months at a time in India and being quite comfortable spending time there and engaging with uh, understanding the culture and community. And then, as you pointed out, having lived in different parts of the United States and now uh, back home in the Intermountain West. Um, so insider and outsider dis distinctions tend to be so fluid and so blurry. But one thing that I have been convinced about is that a religious tradition does well to be a majority in some places and a minority in others. Uh, that when we live as a minority and practice our faith, it gives us a different perspective on our tradition than as a member of a majority in a particular location. And I know this having been Hindu in India and being Hindu in the United States, and particularly in Boise or in Utah, it's a different kind of experience. And in many ways, the other serves as a mirror to ourselves, where we see how uh, an LDS person practices, and we think, this is wonderful, and I wonder what I can find in my own tradition that can reach out and meet that, and what ways can I supplement what I have received 
and in what ways can I learn from what I have received? And that process is something that has been an ongoing thing for me, particularly now since I've moved to uh, Utah, Utah State University, and now BYU. Thank you. Your project while you're here, I understand, has to do with theology. What's your understanding, briefly, because I want to get into some other details, but what's your understanding of religious studies, where you're a professor in a department of history and religious studies? In fact, you are, as of January or June, sometime soon, you will be the department chair of that department at Utah State University. What's the distinction between theology and religious studies, or what's the relationship of them? Yeah. And maybe what should be, as opposed to what is or what's perceived to be? Yeah, theology, I, I like the um, one of the classical Christian definitions of the term of faith-seeking understanding. Uh, and basically, I see it as the systematic pursuit of the intellectual life, but done from a place of commitment. And I mean, theology is as old as any science is in the world in, in terms of various universities that have taught it and studied it across the world. Religious studies, on the other hand, is something that's much newer. It's a product of the Enlightenment. It's uh, really flourished in the United States, maybe in the past what, 60 or 70 years, maybe a little less. Uh, and it begins with an attempt to bracket out matters of commitment and faith and to say it doesn't matter whether you are a member of this tradition or you are a theist or an atheist or whether religion is something that makes a difference in your life or not. But we all recognize that religion is something that is important to study as a human phenomena rather than as a divine phenomena. Uh, and so religious studies begins with bracketing it out, out commitment, uh, not rejecting it, ideally, not rejecting commitment, but saying we cannot speak about that. Uh, we have no authority to speak about it. And by studying exclusively the human phenomenon of religion as opposed to the divine phenomena of revelation, for example, and studying those aspects of religion which are human, the social, the cultural, the historical, the textual, and so on. Do you find one more important than the other, or they're both friends. Yeah, they both hopefully, ideally, should be friends. And I see both as essential to understanding how religion works, both the perspective of the person with commitment and one who stands outside of that committed fold. I think both bring insights into the study of uh, religion that are essential. And uh, my earlier podcast with Blair, I think we dove into some of the finer points about how that works and the risks there. Yeah, I'll refer listeners to that interview again. I think it would be helpful context for our conversation. Theology is something of a foreign term to Latter-day Saints, or where it's a common term, what it means may not be the same as what you're talking about, or at least how you intend to practice it. One broad sensibility among the Latter-day Saints is we have prophets who need theologians. We're getting our information directly from the Lord, and we don't need intellectuals or scholars or scribes um, intruding over much. Or Latter-day Saints may hear theology and think of it as the religious stuff that they believe that prophets teach, or they may hear it as synonymous with doctrine or official pronouncements from church leaders. So talk to me a little bit more about the nature of theology or types or your version of, of what you're doing when you're studying theology this semester or thinking about it. I, I think theologians do multiple things, and that's of course a large topic, but there's a couple of things I would like to highlight, which I think are very important for any tradition. Uh, the first is that theologians provide a consistent and comprehensive understanding of a tradition in a way that makes sense for today's world, for the audience whom they address. So by that I mean theologians take things like revelation and history and tradition and 
practice. And these various elements can sometimes have a staccatoed feel to them. They can be a little here and a little there, and they might look like they conflict at times, and sometimes they, they don't quite match. And a theologian is someone who is able to bring some aspect of the tradition and make it whole, bring it together, and then take that and apply it to the concerns of our world, make it relevant and make it applicable, even to innovate in ways that are still loyal to the tradition. I like to think of revelation as the grist of theology. It's what theologians, there's no theology without revelation. But at the same time, revelation is something by its very nature that is meant to persist over large periods of time and over large numbers of people, perhaps in different parts of the world. Theology, on the other hand, takes that and says, okay, what does that revelation mean for our times today? How does it make sense of where we have been in the past? And what does this revelation, what are its implications for the future? So it's like if I had, you know, stone ground wheat flour, strong wheat flour, that's ideal for baking, right? So without that wheat, which is the revelation, one could not bake bread. And yet it's the baker who takes that goodness and decides we're going to make sourdough bread, or is this going to be whole wheat bread, or is this going to be a cinnamon roll? And all of those things that we can be fashioned from it based on what the family wants to eat and what would be good for us, et cetera, et cetera. That's the work of the baker. And that's the theologian taking that goodness that comes from revelation and seeing how it can be fashioned to best nourish uh, the community in which they work. So that speaks to the function and benefit of theology potentially to the community. Are there any risks inherent in that process or in, within the Hindu tradition, I realize, and some listeners may realize, that Hinduism is rather a shorthand term for a bazillion religious impulse uh, emerging out of the subcontinent uh, of India, so a very complex phenomena, but I'll use that shorthand and you can amend as you like. But within the Hindu tradition, there will be religious leaders, there will be spiritual leaders, there will be authority, religious authority, as opposed to academic authority in some sense. Are there tensions or risks to be navigated? Uh, most certainly. I think throughout history and across different traditions, ecclesiastical authority has always lived in tension with theological with theologians and theological authority. I think that's a very natural thing. It's almost unavoidable, uh, just because once someone gets thinking, as theologians do, and once someone knows as much as theologians do about a particular tradition, it's just as easy as it is to nourish. It's also as easy to poke and to jab and to point out inconsistencies and to nudge the tradition to move in a particular direction. And all of that can be at odds and in tension with those for whom their purpose and their job is to keep a tradition, keep an institution stable and consistent and contained. And I think that that tension is exactly where we want to be. There are ways, of course, in which that tension can become unhealthy. It can become so great that it results in chaos and, and, and conflict. But there are also ways in which it can be unhealthy because it lacks sufficient tension and sufficient ability to not just nourish, but also to break open. And I think the healthiest circumstances are when both of those forces, the forces of consistency and calmness and stability are in healthy tension with those that push a tradition to move and adapt and innovate in ways that keep it relevant, fresh, exciting, um, and, and good for everyone involved. And so again, I go back to the metaphor of, of the cook, 
where, yes, it's good to have those staples and that comfort food that nourishes us on those cold winter days when life is looking a little bit dreary and bleak. But it's also good to break open and to try other things that will give us a broader palate and also a wider range of nourishing goodness. And so that tension has existed in my own tradition. It's existed throughout much of the world's religions. I, I, I think it's, it, it will always remain. But I, I don't think we should fear that tension so much that it draws us away from engaging in the very important work of theology. Hmm. Feel free to deflect this if this is too personal a question, but has that tension existed in Ravi Gupta's head <laughs> or Ravi Gupta's heart as in the course of your academic career? Most certainly, most certainly, Phil. I've come to recognize that this is something that's going to be part of my life forever, in that as a religious studies scholar and as someone grounded in my own tradition, I will always be living between two worlds and negotiating them for myself. But I think the nice thing about that is that I'm able to bring that into the classroom, where here in Utah, um, so many of my students are deeply religious themselves. And as they enter the classroom, they are engaging with what they study and trying to understand it, understand the ways in which it relates to who they are as a religious person. And I think when they see something of that in their teacher, I think it gives them some sense of at least courage to go ahead and say, ah, it might be worth taking the risk of dabbling into areas that are a little bit unsettling and somewhat worrisome and risky, because after all, it seems that others have done the same and they seem to be fine as well. So hopefully that tension, that multiple identities that exists within me is something that can be of good for the world uh, rather than unsettling those around me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I have spent a generation telling students to try to work through contradictions or apparent contradictions and find conceptual, emotional, if you're a religious person, spiritual or religious integrity and yet tension holds galaxies together and holds solar systems together and holds people and societies together. So I like very much um, mm. what you say. Could you talk to me a little bit about the types of theology you navigate? Within the Latter-day Saint tradition, there's a famous philosopher, more philosopher than theologian, but he wrote an important book, or at least an influential book on Latter-day Saint theology and a separate important book about Latter-day Saint philosophy. Um, his name was Sterling McMurrin, a prominent, um, one of the most prominent intellectuals to emerge from Latter-day Saint culture in the second half of the 20th century and was John F. Kennedy's commissioner of education, the equivalent to a secretary of education. So he was prominent nationally in some circles. But he did these works of theology and philosophy that tried to categorize the Latter-day Saint conception of God or the Latter-day Saint conception of salvation and put it in historical context with classical Christian categories. And it always seemed a little bit wooden or that the matrix that he set up didn't capture the life of the community. Somehow that's very different than a contemporary theologian like the Maxwell Institute's own Terrell Givens or Adam Miller or Blake Osler, other people we could name, Truman Madsen in earlier decades, who Elder Bruce McConkie uh, did a, a taxonomy through a legal lens of sorts called Mormon doctrine that was very influential for more than half a century. So again, that's related to what is it, and you've done a nice job explaining what you mean by the term, but still within your definition, there are types of theology. Anything you'd like to share with us about your reflections on that? Yeah, the theologians come in many different varieties. I, I think one way uh, to distinguish them is where they stand or where they work from, where they belong. And by that, I mean those that work within the context of religious institution and those that work from outside the context of religious institution. Now, as theologians, both would work from a place of commitment, 
uh, but the nature of that commitment would be different. And each can, can do and accomplish different things in good ways. So the one who stands outside of institution can move it in ways that the one inside cannot by poking at the sides, for example, by pointing out inconsistencies or issues or this is where we need to go in the next 50 years. This is how our theology is impacting these people who are on the margins of the institution. Location, for example, is a very important, I think, distinguishing factor amongst different kinds of theologians, and, and, and those various locations are all important. Uh, another way in which we might distinguish uh, theologians is the types of questions that concern them. There are those who are concerned primarily with questions within the doctrines and th an internal theology of that tradition, working out inconsistencies, um, showing reasonability, uh, applying older revelation to contemporary times, and demonstrating its change in meaning or application. And then there are those who say that all is well and good, but my concern is being in a larger world and demonstrating how my theology impacts and engages with a world that may be not consisting primarily of, of members of my faith. Uh, people who, who engage with matters of uh, environment or uh, social justice or uh, questions of, of um, uh, uh, religious pluralism, all of those are other ways uh, other types of questions that a theologian might be concerned with. So both in terms of their location, uh, where they stand, and then secondly, what kinds of questions concern them. I think um, we can distinguish various kinds of theologians. We're um, nearing the last stage of our interview with Dr. Ravi Gupta visiting the Neil A. Maxwell Institute uh, from Utah State University, where he is the Charles Redd Professor of Religious Studies there. Let me ask you just a couple of three more questions, Ravi. One is from outside the tradition or out, uh, in secular eyes, theologians may be a little in-house and why aren't we separating church and state more thoroughly? Don't bug me with your religious commentary. That isn't always the case, but it is the stance of some thinkers. Does theology reflection of and within a tradition have anything to say to the outside world who may be impatient with the very existence of theologians or think that they're scarcely relevant to the pressing issues that are tearing at the country and at the world? I, I certainly think so. Um, uh, there are, of course, ways in which theologians can make many people impatient, uh, both outside their tradition but also within it. Uh, and we have many examples in, in history of, of conversations and discussions that uh, today and in their own times many people rolled their eyes at and said, this is the theologians talking about things that scarcely matter to anyone here with their feet on the ground. But I think uh, that is, that's where the responsibility of theologians become so important. Uh, and, and I think this is something that all people who live the life of the mind have to be concerned with. I, I, this is true of, of religious studies scholars. It's true of historians and of philosophers that it can become very easy and, and sometimes comfortable uh, for us to speak only to ourselves. And that work is, of course, essential. We can't speak to the world unless we speak to ourselves. But always making sure that the questions that we raise have relevance and the answers that we give are comprehensible to a wider public. And I think that's where we, as in theologians, as in scholars like you and I, have to keep our awareness always sharp on that matter and to say, I want to speak in a way that makes sense to the world. And I think if we do so, uh, what we can offer is exactly what people are looking to hear from religious communities. They, uh, so much of the world um, is, is hoping, is looking to hear what 
religious traditions have to say and have to contribute to the problems of our day. And theologians have such an important role to play in that if we take that mission seriously. Mm, thanks. Um, my understanding of your work while you're here is that it's um, theological envisioning and mapping out a road to proceed on with theological reflection uh, that center in two arenas, and one of them is echo theology. Could you tell us a little bit why, how you came to that, and what it is you're after there, what you're pursuing? Yeah, um, this is one of those things that that really was not something I had planned uh, as a next step in my academic work, but uh, various elements in this world and in my life came together and it, it started to become clear that this is a matter of great need uh, within the Hindu community and particularly the Vaishnava community. So as you mentioned earlier, Hinduism is a very broad term referring to uh, what is better thought of as a family of religious traditions. And within that family, I belong to the Vaishnava tradition, which also is a family which we could narrow down further. But suffice to say for now that Vaishnavas are those who worship Vishnu or Krishna as the supreme deity. And um, within the Vaishnava community, uh, uh, this has become a uh, growing concern and amongst Hindus generally. Uh, how does Hinduism give us resources to um, respond to the ecological crisis that we find our world in? Uh, a crisis that is very, very visible to the naked eye in India and all over the world. And what are ways in which our tradition sets up roadblocks for us to respond constructively to uh, the problems of the environment that we humans have created? And so that question of what can we contribute and how do we stop blocking the way, those questions are what have concerned me recently. And so I've been trying to, while at the Maxwell, read broadly about this subject, not just within the Hindu tradition uh, where there's precious little written on this topic, uh, but also more broadly within the Christian traditions, for example, uh, and engage in conversations with others, listen to lectures, uh, and really try to develop my thinking on how would the tradition respond in a systematic, thoughtful way that is engaged with our history and looking forward to the future on matters of ecology and the environment. Why is there so little written? Well, a couple of things. One is that theology done in English for the Hindu community is just very, there's very little of it. Uh, not just on matters of ecology, but in general, uh, simply because the time span that Hindus have had to think of their tradition and articulate it in a professional context in the English language is uh, can be counted in, in, in decades, not centuries or millennia. There has been, of course, amazing work done in Sanskrit and traditional Indian languages. But then on the matter of ecology in particular, the ecological issues that India faces are so, so very recent compared to the span of history that Hinduism has flourished uh, uh, in, on the Indian subcontinent. Um, and, and by recent, I mean that technology and society has moved so quickly in India that culture, religion, theology, has not had the chance as yet to catch up and make sense of what's happening. One very little example is, um, to this day, regular phone lines, that is landlines, don't work in India. And if you ask for a landline, it would work maybe less than half the time. India never had the trajectory from, uh, I remember the, the rotary dial phones, and then the touchtone phone, and then the big, huge cordless phones that we used to use and you could walk out into your driveway to talk and then the flip phones that gave you freedom as through cell phone towers to speak anywhere and now the smartphone. India has skipped all of those stages and gone from not having any phones to every man, woman 
and many children having smartphones in their hands today in a matter of decades. It has been nearly impossible for culture and religion and society to keep up with that pace of change that has arrived in India in just the last 20, 30, maybe 40 years. And so there's a lot of work that theologians, cultural critics, and writers and thinkers and activists, there's a lot of work that they have to do in order to bring everyone along as even as technology races forward and tears things apart before we can even catch a breath. Well, we feel breathless enough in this country, but that sounds yet more dramatic. Uh, the other theological focus of your interest has to do with interfaith dialogue, interfaith theology. Talk to us about that. Perhaps there's even a bridge with eco-theology in some ways. Now, this is something that I've been thinking about much longer than eco-theology, and it goes back well to my childhood without, I mean, thinking about it systematically then, but the roots of it go back to my childhood in the ways that we've already talked about, having grown up in an interfaith context. And uh, I think um, I, I think here the Hindu tradition has done a lot more thinking over um, not just decades, but centuries of living with various religious traditions. India, in many ways like the United States, except for a much longer period of time, India has been a place where multiple religious traditions have not only existed, but found a home and flourished. Everything from ancient communities of Christians and Jews to the world's um, second largest population of Muslims, and of course Hindus, Buddhists who were born in uh, the tradition born in India and, and then spread around uh, the world, Jainism, Sikhism, and other uh, lesser known traditions. Uh, India has been a, uh, a flourishing garden of religious variety and sometimes a hotbed with conflicts of various kinds happening as well in its history. And so there's been a lot of thought given to um, what does it mean to have uh, a religious other as my neighbor? What does it mean to engage in conversation with a religious leader from another tradition? There are such accounts narrated and recorded in Hindu sacred texts for some centuries now. And so trying to extract from that what is it um, that we can take and the principles that we can articulate for a theology of religious pluralism um, for our present day. Uh, that's actually quite a fun and exciting sort of project. And by religious pluralism, you don't mean making up a religious milkshake and smirging entities exactly. <laughs> No, not at all. That's very much not the idea of an interfaith theology, uh, but really to say, given the reality of pluralism in our world, given the reality of, of sorry, plurality in our world, of there being many different religions and traditions and many varieties within a tradition, how do we make sense of that? And one of the principles that we find emerging from Hindu traditions is that on matters of ultimacy, the more important something is, the more of it we can expect. And so, especially on matters of ultimacy, ultimate questions of God and the nature of the world and so on, we can expect the greatest amount of variety. Rather than saying, the higher we go, the more important the question becomes, the more singular the answer should be. So Hindu traditions have argued that singularity is generally speaking something that is a result of us not looking carefully enough. And the more we dive into something, the more types of it, the more varieties, the more different kinds we find. Thank you. Like all of our points, I wish we could take an hour on each uh, of your responses and spread it out, but this will be an invitation to, for all of us to pay careful attention to your work as it finds its way into public presentations in, I hope, oral and written um, form. Any 
interest given your location, which you have talked about, surrounded by a fair number of Latter-day Saints? Do you have any, in your own personal academic work, um, interest in interfaith partnership in eco-theology, exploring it, or interfaith theology on other grounds with Latter-day Saints? Uh, very much so. Uh, while during my time at the Maxwell, but also living in Utah and Idaho for much of my life, I've there are many different elements of the LDS tradition that I've I've learned more about and grown to love as well, and to learn something from. And I think interfaith theology, but any form of theology, is best done in conversation with religious others, with partners from various traditions where we can discuss and reflect and question in ways that we can't simply when we're talking to ourselves. And so I sincerely hope that this will emerge into some kind of dialogue, uh, both in verbal, uh, oral, but also in written forms, uh, that uh, my dream one day is to write uh, a interfaith uh, engagement uh, that's co-authored with myself and a partner from the LDS tradition where we each talk about where we come from and how we view each other and where that goes. So this is not yet in the works. It's just one of those dreams for the future, but um, the Max, being at the Maxwell, I think, is a good start for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, whatever Latter-day Saint scholar partners with you on that will be privileged. I've seen enough in the half dozen years to know that that could be a rich enterprise. Thank you. I was just lying about three final questions. Here's the final, final one. Um, the Latter-day Saints have an article of faith, the culminating article of faith, um, of which there are 13, that in joins Latter-day Saints to seek out that which is virtuous, lovely, and of good report. Anything that is good or true or beautiful, um, early church leaders taught, go, uh, including Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and others. And the 13th article, Faith, continues to be influential among the saints. Seek out those things that are virtuous or true or lovely or noble or edifying and learn from them and absorb them and make them part of your own religious tradition, our own religious tradition. We could do that more than we do, perhaps, but um, it's there for us to continue to unfold. One, um, I've learned many things from you in the last half dozen years, but one thing, even before I met you, that I learned from the Hindu tradition that I liked, I think it was when I was scanning uh, a humble English translation of the Upanishads, um, but you may correct me, and um, it may have come from elsewhere, but as I remember it, to action alone thou hast a right not to its fruits. Mm. Yes. Act according to true principles, whether or not you get to claim the fruits. That's affected me over life. I've thought about it a good deal and tried to, at least selectively, but uh, be informed by it. Have you learned anything from the Latter-day Saints in as a mirror image of that? Anything um, Hinduism rather famously actually is flexible and absorbing, and yes, we like that, and that's that illustrates the Hindu principle of X or Y. Uh, I'd just be interested to conclude if you've encountered anything like that from your encounter with my people. <laughs> yes, uh, Phil. In fact, there are there are many things. I'll, I'll just mention two uh, that come to mind right away. And um, the first is, as you've mentioned, I've lived in many parts of the country with different sorts of religious demographics. And I've, I've lived in places where people are very committed to their faith. And that commitment um, to their faith often translates into being closed off to other people's faith, even uh, a bit uh, nervous about coming too close to someone from another tradition, uh, seeing it as too risky or sometimes worse. I've also, on the other hand, lived in places where people are very open to others' faith and people from other traditions 
and yet that has often meant that they are not committed to any tradition themselves. Here amongst the LDS, one thing I've really come to appreciate and I really see as a model for how a religious person can live is the fact that um, so many of uh, so many friends and acquaintances and co-workers that I know are deeply committed to their tradition and yet so open and willing to learn from the traditions of others. And I think that is a magic combination. I think it's something that any person of faith ought to aspire to, is to say, being open to others does not translate into a lack of commitment to one's own. And conversely, a lack of commitment or a commitment to one's own does not translate into a fear of the other. And so I've really come to appreciate that across the board amongst colleagues, amongst my students, and amongst friends in the community. The other thing that I'll mention is, um, is what I've seen as a commitment to the systematic study of one's own tradition. I, I see the Maxwell, I see Brigham Young University, and I see the ways in which so many of my very thoughtful uh, LDS friends are committed to uh, understanding and diving deep into their tradition, but also investing resources into supporting the systematic study of their own tradition, whether through historical means or theological means and so on. And that's something that I think the Hindu community can learn a lot from. Having the immigrant experience that we have in the West, there's been naturally, I think, and rightly, an emphasis on making it for oneself in this world and surviving and flourishing and making sure that the children flourish economically and so on. But as we lay down roots that are now several generations old here in the United States, I think it's more and more important that we think of ways in which we can um, support not just our personal and community flourishing in economic terms, but our flourishing theologically and culturally and religiously by supporting the systematic academic intellectual study of our tradition. And so in many ways, uh, my experience at the Maxwell has been inspiring uh, for me as I go back into my own community of faith. Mm. Well, that's lovely. Thank you so much. I can speak for my colleagues um, rather literally because I've heard so many comments while you've been down with us here at the Maxwell Institute about what a privilege it is to have you with us. And a year or two ago when you came down to offer a public lecture in pre-pandemic times um, and, and consult with us here on that earlier occasion. So we trust that we'll have an ongoing working relationship uh, as long as we breathe air on this world, I hope. Uh, but it's lovely to take an hour with you. Uh, you're very generous with your time, as you always are. And thanks so much, Ravi. Thank you so much, Phil. It's really a pleasure talking to you today. I'm really happy to have this opportunity. That wraps things up for 2020. What a year it's been. We'll be back next year with more episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast. But before we go, of course, we have some reviews to look at here. We have one from Tucson Native who says, Thank you, Maxwell Institute, for strengthening my testimony through scholarly research. Well, you're welcome, Tucson Native. We really appreciate you listening. We have another review. This name, uh, is, I'm just going to spell this out. I think they may have, maybe the, a cat walked across the keyboard here. U-Q-I-P-R-O-J-K-L-D-F-A-Z-C-V-N. Uquidprojgladfazkvn. Okay. Uh, they say, uh, what is the prize for listening to each episode Twice. I'm finding so much depth and things to think about here. So I'm thinking about listening twice. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, that's in reference to our Completist Club. We have a few new members of the Completist Club. This is people who've listened to every episode thus far of the Maxwell Institute podcast. And welcome to the club to Paul MacArthur, Matthew Morgan, and Jared Gillens or Gillens. I, I th Jared even told me, I think, in, the, in his email uh, what the proper pronunciation is. But as as listeners know, one of the awards here, one of the one of the benefits of becoming a completist is you have the opportunity of having me mispronounce your name uh, at the end of an episode. So, Jared, uh, I said Gillens and Gillens. We'll, we'll go with either one of those. 
That's it for the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm Blair Hodges, and we will see you next year.